So, um, hello everybody and welcome to the, I've forgotten what number, Armour Lecture, Armour Lecture 2019. Um, we are um, in a moment going to have um, a couple of presentations. We will have a short time for uh, Q&A at the end of the presentations. And then if people want to continue the discussion, uh, we will go back downstairs and you'll be able to continue having some drinks and some chat. Um, this is a um, um, arthritis and musculoskeletal alliance event, so we do understand that sitting still for an hour is not brilliant for one's musculoskeletal health. So if anybody feels the need to stand up and move around, please feel free to do that. We are filming the presentations tonight, so those will be available um, online in a week or so after this, so if you want to share it with colleagues who couldn't make it, um, please feel free. Just in case there's anyone in the room who doesn't know uh, what armour is, uh, we, we are um, an umbrella body bringing together the patient and the professional organisations working on musculoskeletal health. Our vision for musculoskeletal health is that the MSK health of the population is promoted throughout life and that everyone with a musculoskeletal condition receives appropriate high quality interventions to promote their health and well-being in a timely manner. I should have said my name's Sue Brown and I'm the chief executive of ARMA. That would have helped, wouldn't it? Um, ARMA can only do what we do with the support of our members and our partners. And we're very grateful to Versus Arthritis for being the lead sponsor of tonight's event and also to um, UCB for a supporting sponsorship. So thank you very much for that. And before we start, I would like to invite Liam O'Toole, the Chief Executive of Versus Arthritis, our lead sponsor, to say a few words. Liam. Thank you, Sue. And it's great to see so many familiar faces here. Um, this annual armor lecture has always been a very special ev event. So. At Versus Arthritis, we're delighted to be sponsoring it this year. Um, on the way up here to this very special venue, I was just reflecting on the, the 10 years I've been working in the sector, and it really does feel like we've come a long way. If you think about um, how much we talked about arthritis 10 years ago, and it feels like now it's starting to get some of the attention that it deserves, and that is due to everyone in this room, working as individuals, working in their own organizations, but also importantly, working together as armor and working increasingly effective as armor. So we've still got a long way to go, but actually we, we ought to reflect that we're starting to make progress and getting some of the recognition that people living with pain, fatigue, and isolation deserve. I'm really looking forward to hear from Brendan um, I think everybody in this room who, like us in Versus Arthritis, spends their every day working with, listening to, supporting, and helping people living with pain, fatigue, and isolation know about the, the close connection between um, MSK and mental health. Connection in many ways, causative as, as sort of comorbidity, but also there's another link in that I think mental health and, and musculoskeletal conditions are also treated in similar ways by society, often seen as invisible, often trivialized, often given a relatively low priority. So I think the, this is a really important lecture, really important subject, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing what Brendan's got to say. So when Armour was planning our activities for 2019, our members identified a number of topics that were a priority, and one of those was mental health. Um, depression and anxiety are common in people with musculoskeletal conditions. Depression is four times more common in people with persistent pain than it is in people who don't have persistent pain. So we've done a number of things uh, over the year to try and highlight this, um, and this lecture is part of that. But before we hear from tonight's keynote speaker, I would like to introduce someone for whom this topic is a daily reality. 
Sue Patey has kindly agreed to come here today and to tell us her story. Sue. <clears throat> Hello, and I'm really grateful for Sue and Versus Arthritis, Liam, for inviting me here. I really didn't know what to expect. That's, anyway, I do apologise for sitting down, but with the um, arthritis having my knees and my back standing is, is quite uncomfortable. So anyway, I've just been introduced. So I'm Sue. I'm a retired special school teacher, a job I absolutely used to love. I used to teach um, young adults aged 16 to 18 years old with severe autism, behavioural problems. It's very physical, very demanding, and I absolutely loved it. And and, and you know that that was that was my reason for for living sometimes with those young people. Um, if you go back, I've had arthritis in my knees since I was in my late teens, and then you know doctors used to say to my mum, um, "Are you Catholic? Do you go to church and kneel down a lot and pray?" That's that's where they were then. Um, but since then, I've had um, a prolapsed disc, which has ended up with sciatica. So I've got arthritis in my back, in my shoulder and my hands, and I've had numerous operations. Um, my, my mental health, I suppose, became more, more of an issue about 10 years ago after my third major back operation. So I had um, a laminectomy, a decompression, and a fusion within about four years, but, you know, from start to finish. And they, they never said that the fusion was going to be 100% successful, which, you know, it, it's better now than it was. But that was really the beginnings of living with um, long-term pain. Um, so fast forward a bit, I'd, I'd coped well until 2015 when I had um, operation on my thumb, my left thumb. I had a trapeziumectomy. And people think, well, you've only had an operation on your hands. It can't be that bad. But actually, you try living life even for 24 hours without being able to use one hand at all. You cannot do anything. You can't dress yourself. You can't wash yourself. You can't cook. You can't eat unless somebody cuts your food up for you. You can't do your hair. You can't do your nails. You can't do this. You can't do that. You couldn't drive. I couldn't play my flute. So the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Um, so the recovery for that was about a year. I had a really good hand physiotherapist as well. And I didn't even know they existed until I had that operation. Um, so then work started looming again because you automatically signed off for six weeks. And I had a phased return to work. Um, that didn't really go as it should have done for, for lots of reasons, but I knew my mental health was getting worse and worse and worse. And that was when, um, so by, that's right, it became so bad, i never forget this day, I went into work, it was October the 10th, no, October the 3rd, 2015. And I, I, it was anxiety, it was paranoia, it was, depression, it was a lot. I had a full-blown panic attack. And my head teacher said, well, go home if you want, but we won't do anything, you know, just go home. So, you know, the school, you'd have thought a school, local education, and, and all of the work they do with, you know, work-life balance and looking after your mental health, they didn't want to know. And I was actually getting told off for not telling everybody that I had mental health issues which I found quite offensive, actually. It was very offensive. So the, um, I was put into contact with talking therapists for the first time. Now, they were really good the first time around. Um, and now the first time I went to um, talking therapists, I was able to talk about specific difficulties that were really making me feel really depressed and so um, I was able to lead the sessions and I found those really really useful and it was quite a shame in a way that I had to you know stop seeing her because she was so helpful 
But I always knew the door was open because once, I'm, I assume you all and you know that it's once you've been to a talking therapist, you can self-refer, you don't have to go back through your GP. So I, I, I knew I always had that. Um, so I had my phase return to work, but that still didn't go very well. I had this awful, awful panic attack. And um, so fast forward a few more months after I, I, I worked for the very last day, I had surgery on this hand this time. That was another trapeziumectomy, so that was another year. And then what had happened to this hand, because I couldn't use this hand at all, this hand became very bad, so I was getting chronic pain from this hand and acute pain from this hand and chronic pain in this hand and acute pain in this hand. So then I ended up having um, this joint replaced, which I never knew you could, and this joint fused. But my hands are a mess anyway, but there we go. So I went, I mean, I've had shoulder surgery and that was my really my darkest time. So I went back to talking to therapists. I, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't wash. I couldn't dress. I couldn't put a hand, my hand in my pocket. I went back to talking to therapists. And they wanted to do um, an online approach, which didn't help. Oh, right, let's write some SMART goals. You know, I've done those all my life, and they didn't help. And then we had sessions on the phone. But that was still reading from a script and sending me um, workbooks. And that didn't help. They didn't understand. And I contacted Mind, and I contacted the Samaritans, and they were so unhelpful. And, but then I was so lucky. I was referred to the pain clinic, although they didn't do anything about my mental health problems. I met the most amazing physio I have ever, 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 ever met. And he kept me sane for a year, both before and post. I had a reverse total shoulder replacement just under a year ago. Uh, so that was one thing that really, really helped. Um, you know, nobody ever asked me how I was feeling, though. My doctor didn't. The, my, the shoulder, when the, the guy I saw for um, the physio on my shoulder, he did ask. He, he knew that I was hurting inside, emotionally as well as physically. Um, you know, and, and other things. I, I can't enjoy life like I used to. I mean, I've been up twice this week, and this is one of them. I think, oh, that's really good for me. But my other trip out this week was driving Ferraris at 120 miles round, an hour round Castle Coombe track down in Swindon. So that was a really good, you know, that was really good. But, you know, I'm going to be exhausted after today because I spent all day getting ready, and I worry about how I'm going to do. I'm worried about what people are thinking about me, and... and and are they looking at me? I mean, I'm, I'm, I can have a life, and just everything I do, it's the worry and the pain. Or if I do that, it's going to hurt. And if I, if I put my hand behind my back, I know that's really going to hurt because that's one thing a reversed um, operation can't help with. I can't reach behind my back anymore. And you do that quite a bit. I can't do it anymore. But um, to finish, firstly, I mean, I'd like to thank... Um, everybody at Versus Arthritis for inviting me here and put me in touch with Sue. We've had a couple of very interesting conversations on the phone, but the best people who have gone to for help and support and have listened to me has been Versus Arthritis Helpline. They have been the most amazing group of people I've come across. They've actually given me, well, why don't you try this? Why don't you do this? It's not like, oh, well, we can't do anything. There's not a group in your area. Oh, that was interesting. Thank you for telling me your story. Bye-bye. That was Samaritans, by the way. So, you know, versus arthritis have really, really helped me, and um, I'm hope I'm paying them back a bit by the, the campaigning that I do for them. And... There we go. I've run out of time. I do have more to say, but I'm going to get elbowed soon, so I will finish. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sue. Um, and I know that it is very difficult to talk about your own personal experience. It's very different for me to stand up here and talk in theory. Um, as I said, we did, we've done various things as Armour this year to highlight mental health and musculoskeletal health. Earlier this year, we held a roundtable, uh, which was chaired by Paul Farmer, who's the chief executive of MIND, 
brought together people working on musculoskeletal health and people working on, on mental health. And the one thing, that, one of the things that we identified at that round table was that people with musculoskeletal conditions see lots and lots and lots of clinicians. And every time one of those clinicians does not raise the issue of mental health is a missed opportunity. And I think Sue has experienced exactly that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And in, in all of those years, all of those missed opportunities to talk about the mental impact of musculoskeletal conditions, which is why we have been so keen to raise that issue in both the mental health and the musculoskeletal health world, and why I'm delighted to introduce our keynote speaker for the evening, Brendan Stubbs, who is Head of Physiotherapy for South London and Maudsley NHS Foundation Trust, and also NIHR Clinical Lecturer at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at King's College London, and is the perfect person to speak on this subject. Brendan. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind invitation, um, Sue. Uh, it's a huge burden of responsibility for me to try and convey the importance of mental health. Um, I hope I'll do my best over the course of this brief talk. And, and thank you also so much, Sue, for sharing your experience. Um, it was really powerful to hear about that. And it was good to hear about your journey and um, also great as a physiotherapist to hear about the important role of physiotherapy within your journey which is which is great and if you ever want to see a physiotherapist um out and about we wear blue trousers um so that's what that's so you can spot a physiotherapist when they're going around like i am tonight um i'm a bit concerned because a few people have said to me they're looking forward to me talking tonight which is just really really genuinely concerned me because ever since i first ever gave a presentation i've i've sent people off to sleep when i talk and in fact, on Monday, I gave a talk in a really small room, about 10 people, and after about 10 minutes, someone started snoring. Um, and all throughout, every time I've given a talk, I've always just had this wonderful ability just to send people off to sleep whenever I'm talking. And I used to get myself really, really anxious about um, you know, sending people off to sleep, and often people, I'd see people you know, nodding off or, or snoring. But then a psychiatry colleague just said to me, and he said, Brendan... You know, if you do send people to sleep, it's one of the kindest things you can do. Um, because apparently sleep's very good for your physical and also for your mental health as well. Um, so I won't take it too personally if anyone does uh, fall to sleep over the course of this particular talk. But I've, I've kind of learned the hard way. Um, I really interrupt, um, interrupt, I enjoy interruptions during my talk um, in order to try and make it a bit more interactive. I've got some slides which I'd like to go through, but... Um, I'm very happy to go off on tangents, to be interrupted, to put your hand up, to go throughout the, the, the course of the talk. Um, so, what, what would I like to convey briefly over this um, talk today as, as best as I can? Really, I wanted to get across the, the, the key message, which is mental health is, is all of our business. And look at the relationship and provide some of the data and the evidence, hopefully keeping you awake around the issue of musculoskeletal conditions and why people may be at risk of having an increased mental health comorbidity. And then looking within my own biases as a physiotherapist, looking at the potential role of physical activity for the prevention and management of mental health comorbidity. And I don't need to tell anybody in this room just how important it is for your physical health. And as Sue kindly mentioned in her opening talk, please get up and move around for your physical and musculoskeletal health but also for your mental health, as we'll talk about um, later on today. Please view my slides with a huge amount of white hat bias. I think mental health is really, really important. Um, and I've written guidelines for the European Psychiatric Association about the importance of um, physical activity particularly. And we've recently published a, a Lancet commission looking at how can we improve the physical health, including musculoskeletal health, of people that use mental health care services um, and, and I've also written a book. So I please view this with biased eyes, while I will try and stick to data as we go on. And um, I'm also funded by the NIHR, which is the research arm of the NHS. Everybody still with me? <laughs> so um, all of us have physical health. 
all of us have musculoskeletal health and all of us have mental health, um, just like we have physical health. And, you know, it's by virtue of statistics that many of us, you know, at least a, a quarter of us in this room have sought treatment for our mental health at one particular time. Um, and it's important to uh, acknowledge that, that we all have mental health and we all have times that our mental health can be uh, compromised or we can become distressed and need to seek treatment for that. I'm going to largely cover the issue of, 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 sort of depression and anxiety over the course of this particular talk, um, um, but I'm not really going to talk so much about what we call quote-unquote serious mental health conditions, not to say that any mental health condition is not serious, but we, we tend to refer to those as, as schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Um, and I didn't say at the start um, that I, I still work as a clinician and all of the people that I see are for musculoskeletal conditions, 95%, in a mental health trust. So I'm there assessing and managing people's musculoskeletal conditions in the context of mental health. So this is uh, some data from the World Health Organization to put into context what is um, the leading causes of years lived with disability um, that are interfering with, with people's ability to, to do their daily lives? And what you can see on the top there, and this is reaffirmed by Global Burden of Disease or, or other formats, is that mental health and, and neuropsychiatric conditions contribute to an enormous amount of years lived with disability. And this is often and very comorbid with other conditions such as musculoskeletal conditions as we'll talk over the course of the evening but mental health is a you know a, a really really important topic topic for interfering with with people's lives and it's great to be invited to a, a talk such as this tonight when musculoskeletal conditions we're talking um, about mental health because it's a, it's really really common it's one of the primary reasons people go to their uh, GP or, 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 or FCP to seek help. Um, depression and common mental health conditions such as anxiety, and this was taken from the Times earlier this year, are leading reasons people go and seek help. It may always not present that way. It could be presenting as um, fatigue, lack of sleep, but it's often one of the primary reasons people seek help. Um, I'm not going to go into too much into this, but there are certain criteria that people need to meet to have the diagnostic threshold to be uh, categorised as having clinical depression, um, and see if any of these may be applicable in on their own to people with musculoskeletal conditions. So it could be change in sleep, uh, change in activity, fatigue or loss of energy, guilt or worthlessness, difficulty concentrating. These are some of the key criteria that are needed to be having a diagnosis of clinical depression for a, a, you know, at least two weeks and often longer than that. And of course, these are very common for uh, people having musculoskeletal conditions. Has anyone heard of John Ioannidis in the audience? A few people. Okay, well, John Ioannidis is a professor at Stanford University and he's done the most downloaded research paper of all time of any scientific discipline, you name it, physics, chemistry, medicine, musculoskeletal health, it's the most downloaded research paper. And the title of it was Why Most Published Findings Are False. Um, so you can see why it may have been particularly controversial. But when it comes to complex areas, Professor Ioannidis has developed this statistical framework to understand what may be contributing to the onset of a complex condition such as, such as depression. And he's developed this quantitative framework where you can look at lots of different meta-analyses or pooled studies to understand where is a convincing evidence for being associated with depression. Now, with Professor Ioannidis, we, um, we identified 134 individual meta-analyses that said ex various different factors were related to the onset of depression. Would anybody like to have a guess at how many of these studies, when we reanalyzed and looked for bias, met the criteria for convincing evidence out of 134? Naught. Wow, we've got some a pessimist in the audience. I like it. Anyone go higher? We can't go any lower. <laughs> Ten. Okay. So... These, when we restricted it to prospective or studies that 
cleared people from depression at baseline and this is population level data at an individual level it's very complex and multifactorial we're looking at big data here these were the criteria that were convincingly um, and in the future indicative of the onset of depression for people now, just because a, a risk factor is not there, really at an individual level doesn't mean much at all. This is population level data, i.e. big numbers. So clearly losing, losing a, a loved one, um, trauma during the childhood, um, obesity, having metabolic risk factors, difficulty in relationships and job strain are really you know, convincing risk factors for the onset of depression. Um, going forward and again to emphasize at an individual level is complex and multifactorial um, for any of you who've experienced depression will know um, but depression much like the symptoms of musculoskeletal conditions is, is, is really complex and here was a really nice study where they looked at all of the individual symptoms reported by people with uh, depression and hardly anybody reports the same symptoms when you look at data on large numbers of people kind of like if you've got lots of people with uh, arthritis and you're asked about their common symptoms is not everybody's symptoms will be exactly the same and we see this really uh, commonly in, 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 in mental health comorbidity um, so why may people with musculoskeletal and arthritis conditions be at particular increased risk of having mental health comorbidity um, would anybody like to throw me some suggestions out Pain, fatigue, great ones. Isolation. Difficulty doing the things you used to enjoy and the roles that you've had previously. Yeah, thank you. Lose your identity as well. Yeah, lose your identity. Anybody else? Yeah, loss of work and financial instability is another, another key one. So clearly, as I've just asked from people with expertise in lots of different areas, um, there are a number of key risk factors which could contribute to someone being at increased risk of, of having depression. And I've just picked a number of areas which, um, which we've specifically looked at. So pain was one of the first points which was mentioned earlier on. And this was a piece which we looked at people with depression compared to people without depression and over 240,000 people. And we wanted to look at people's pain score on the bottom here from 0 to 100. So here's people with depression are reporting much more pain compared to people without depression. So pain is a really key important issue. Um, but also, pain can be uh, associated with um, more you know, severe mental health comorbidities such as suicidal ideation or thoughts of not wanting to live anymore. Um, and this is being evident within the literature also. Um, social isolation is another key issue which has been identified within the mental health literature. But also, um, as was outlined by your, yourself, Sue, you know, very eloquently, um, social isolation and, and not having uh, you know, those roles and, and difficulty engaging in work is, is really common. And we uh, found this was evident when we looked at some European data showing that people who have clinical osteoarthritis are much more likely to be socially isolated, and this clearly doesn't help with people's mental health. Um, did anybody mention sleep? No? Well, I mentioned it at the start and said I will send at least one of you to sleep throughout the talk. Um, so uh, sleep or, or lack of is we're recognising this is really, really important for people's physical health, but also people's mental health as well. And uh, we uh, undertook a study again looking at the relationship between pain and sleep disturbance in a large cohort of people and this is country level data and essentially anything these are countries anything to the right hand side of this ver vertical line means that people reporting pain are much more likely in that country to have sleep disturbance compared to people that are not so this is a consistent image that pain is associated with sleep disturbance and this can start an, an exacerbation of people's pain but also uh, exacerbate people's mental health and 
if we look at the published evidence uh, of people with lower limb osteoarthritis, um, this is something um, which, which uh, some colleagues published in Age and Aging, and it was really, really simple uh, piece of research to undertake, but it was just to highlight the mental health comorbidity for people with lower limb osteoarthritis. And essentially, if you look at uh, a group of people with lower limb osteoarthritis, one in, f one in five or 20% will have depression and or anxiety on any one given day. So if you're a clinician or you're seeing 10 people over the course of the day, at least 20% uh, percent of those people will present with anxiety and depression over the course of the day. Um, but back pain is uh, also uh, you know, substantially associated with worse mental health comorbidity within people as well and and when we've looked at people with back pain particularly when it's been lingering on for a longer period of time and and, and so you, you touched upon your experience of, of this as well is you, you see that people who have long-term back pain are much more likely to have increased stress levels difficulty sleeping more likely to have anxiety depression and um, even psychosis um, and again, very much when we look at people with uh, osteoarthritis uh, or, or rheumatoid arthritis, we consistently see an elevated um, prevalence of depression, anxiety, sleep problems, perceived stress, and even psychosis. So there is this consistent mental health comorbidity, which has been highlighted earlier. And one of the key factors that influences people's mental health does appear to be um, pain, um, and this was a piece led by some European colleagues to say what happens when you look at people with osteoarthritis and you look at their mental health over time and how does that differ by pain status? And essentially we're able to, to sort of demonstrate is that people who have more severe pain and more ongoing pain over time are much more likely to have um, lower mental health over time. So it ties very nicely into um, what uh, Sue was talking about in terms of the importance of pain management being closely linked to people's mental health comorbidity going forward. And interestingly, if you look at the experimental pain induction literature, is people familiar with experimental pain induction methods? Some, of, some people may not be, but... Um, so essentially, this is something which people do in pain science, where um, pain by its nature is, is self-report and an individual's experience. But in experimental pain induction, what we can do is we can stimulate pain at a set stimuli or a set, set intensity via an um, electrical device or putting your hand in cold water. And we could, for instance, compare this side of the room versus this side of the room and say that this side of the room, for instance, may have higher pain threshold, pain tolerance, and be less sensitive to pain than this side of the room. Or we could look at different genders, or we could look at people with and without osteoarthritis. And when you actually get to look at the depression literature and you experimentally induce pain, and you compare people without depression, you don't see anywhere near as clear a picture as when you rely on self-report pain data. There is only a slight suggestion of reduced pain uh, threshold and tolerance in people with depression compared to people without, which suggests that pain is much more linked to people's processing and emotional health rather than natural difference in an ability to tolerate pain when you objectively stimulate it. I'm just steamrolling through. Does anyone want any questions? Why is the psychosis alternative to <coughs> Why is there such a strong... It seems counterintuitive to me. I can understand depression and anxiety. Yeah. Counter, the psychosis seems odd. It does. So it could be explained by two different factors. One could be smaller sample size, um, which could mean that it was slightly conflated or increased. Um, and another reason could be that uh, people with that includes people with psychotic episode, um, so people who've just experienced one episode of psychosis, and those people are more likely to present for physical health care issues than people who have long-term established psychosis. And it is counterintuitive because anybody who's worked clinically or experienced uh, psychosis or knows anybody. 
um, we'll, we'll know that people with schizophrenia are often less likely to report or experience pain. And interestingly, if you do experimental pain induction methods in people with schizophrenia and you compare it to people without schizophrenia, there is a consistently reduced pain uh, uh, increased pain tolerance, pain threshold, and, and sensory threshold. So people notice pain later with schizophrenia. They report they can tolerate it for much longer, and can and tolerate much higher levels. But it seems to be something innate within people with schizophrenia because even when you account for antipsychotic medication, which is uh, an analgesic in its own right, and you look at autonomic nervous system response and you experimentally induce pain i.e. you look at pupillary dilation or heart rate response, there is a blunted response in people with schizophrenia um, and established psychosis compared to those without. So it is counterintuitive. Um, we're not sure why, but it could be due to uh, a smaller sample slides pushing up the numbers. Anybody else got any questions? We don't, please feel free to stand any particular time as, as well. Um, so... Almost everything I'm going to go on to tell you now is, is not really that new. We've hopefully been just trying to provide some data and some evidence to what far more innovative uh, and, and forward-thinking people have been saying um, long before we were here, that clearly moving is good for your physical health, but also good for your well-being as well. But what's really exciting, or at least exciting for people like me, if you like data and you like evidence, is that we've been able to eventually catch up with what um, Plato and, and others have been saying for a long period of time. Um, so in the American Journal of Psychiatry, uh, Felipe Schuch is a professor in Brazil and colleagues did a, a really simple study and we looked at everything that had ever been published and we looked at people's habitual levels of physical activity and said, is there a relationship between how active you are amongst non-depressed people and your risk or odds of developing depression in the future. And what we found over 260,000 people over an average of seven and a half years is that those who were most active, around 15% less likely to develop depression in the future. That was evident in children, in adults or older adults, even when we adjusted for other risk factors such as age, socio-demographic information, people's physical health, also, but the most potent effect to protect against future depression was evident when people met recommended physical activity guidelines. Who wants to tell me what they are? 150 minutes a week. Perfect. So when people did 150 minutes a week at baseline compared to people who did not, there was around a 30% reduced risk or odds of developing depression in the future. Now... This is, um, this is prospective data, so we're only observing people over time. And in uh, order to say, is physical activity related to the onset of adverse mental health, we need to do randomised controlled trials. And I'm not quite sure how they got ethical approval for this, but they did. So this was a one-week intervention for people with no, no known mental or physical health comorbidity at baseline. And what they did is people, uh, in this randomised intervention, is told the intervention group to sit still, be more sedentary and do not move, and the control group were able to carry on and do their usual activities. And they looked at people's mental health at baseline, and what you can see after one week of being randomised to sitting still and not moving is the interventions group mental health started to... Uh, deteriorate or increase in this particular measure whereas the control group carried on as usual and the once the intervention stopped people's mental health improved so just one week of kind of enforced sedentary behavior um, not only can have an adverse impact on your musculoskeletal health but can also impact people's mental health as well and we heard you know really clearly from sue just how difficult it can be to get up and get going for musculoskeletal health and also mental health too. Um, we also been quite interested in cardiorespiratory fitness, so how good people's heart and lungs respond to exercise. And, and we looked at this prospectively in over a million people and said, is there a relationship between how good your heart and lungs work and your risk of depression in the future? 
And we found that there was a protective effect for people with the highest level of cardiorespiratory fitness, around 75% less likely to develop depression in the future. Um, and we uh, published this paper in November 2016, and we made the uh, uh, New York Times. And does anybody else remember any significant events happening in November 2016? So there was a there was a presidential election happening at the particular time, and it was it was it was uh, we we made the front page of the New York Times for for some particular reason. And what I really like is the comments for people's articles, um, which come within this, um, because Tom makes a a great comment. And Tom says, um, you know, if I start exercising regularly, will Donald Trump go away? Because um, because otherwise, I think my depression will last for the next four years. Um, and that's a really fair point by um, Tom, because if there is um, a, an external factor, or in this case, as Tom describes it, an irritant, then clearly just moving around and getting your heart and lungs moving as, as, as good as possible is not going to help your mental health improve. So it's a perfect illustration of the, the limitations of observational data. But for any of you who've experienced depression or know somebody or, uh, with depression, um, Leslie makes a really, really key point as well and was really eloquently um, outlined by Sue. If you, if you have depressive symptoms or clinical depression, just getting up and getting out of bed can be enormously difficult for people. So how on earth are we supposed to engage people in, in, in moving around and exercise? And thank goodness that I don't need to come up with, a, you know, sort of a, a clever or witty answer. Um, I can, we can rely on some data. But before I do, I thought it'd be quite good to put up this particular point. Um, and this was somebody on Twitter, and I thought it was she quite eloquently um, made the point. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll read that up. She said, "I'm sick of people who don't have a mental illness saying I should exercise to help my mood." 90% of the time, I don't have the energy to shower or make food. So how the fuck am I going to go to exercise? Just shut up. Can I, can I, just, can I just add to that? I mean, okay, you talked earlier about people with lower level MSK. So I got at my knees and my back and my hips. Okay, and then I got at my knees and my back and my shoulders and my hands. When you have it all over, you're giving exercises to focus on one bit, but it makes something else hurt. Yeah. So when that hurts, you're giving exercises for that. And it makes the first bit hurt again. So whatever you, you know, it's like this. You keep going round and round and you don't get anywhere because one thing makes something hurt and you always think, well, pain is going to be there all the time. Mm. I really, you know, hear that and hear your experience and, and that's my own clinical experience as well as people have pain at lots of different sites based on the evidence as well, it can be more problematic and difficult for people. And, and I've had pain in, in my life for periods as well. And just the thought of moving can just exacerbate pain within me as well. And I know it's very difficult to break that sort of fear of moving cycle and pain. But the, the, the key thing based on the evidence is just to, um, making some small changes initially, just to make some small tweaks to being more active um, and helping people move along the activity continuum. But thank you for sharing that again. Um, so, based on, on that, um, David Van Kampfort is a, a professor in Leuven, and, and I'm not going to go too much onto this, but he's answered a question which many of you will perhaps had of how are we going to help engage people who have high mental health comorbidity and in this case also pain to engage in, uh, in physical activity. And David's done a lot of work on psychological um, frameworks, in particular self-determination theory, and found that just getting people started and interested and achieving small goals around being more active can help people moving from external motivation to experiencing some success and then having a more internal motivation to moving and uh, is intrinsically motivated to go forwards. Um, so what's the current treatment of depression? Um, just the, the, the bulk of the, the research today has, has been medication, and medication's a really important part of people's journey, and many of the 
Antidepressant medications also have analgesic properties too, so in the context of musculoskeletal conditions and pain um, can be really helpful for people. And psychological therapy is, is really in, important, and it was great to hear Sue's experience of psychological therapy, and there's, there's great evidence for people's pain management, fatigue management, but also people's mental health. But I'm really going to just briefly talk about what is the evidence for lifestyle interventions, and particularly moving more for people's mental health. Um, did anybody come across the Cochrane Review for Exercise for Depression in 2013? No? Okay, well, there was some huge issues related to this. Um, there was n uh, many, many biases which uh, were related to this. And within a meta-analysis or pooling of individual studies, we want to calculate something called the standardized mean difference. And a professor in America did a whole critique of the Cochrane Review called Honey, I Shrunk the Pooled Standardized Mean Difference. And initially it was 80 pages long, and it's very, very eloquent. If anybody's interested in critical appraisal of systematic reviews, um, I encourage you to read that. Um, and essentially off the back of the issues with the uh, Cochrane Review, Felipe um, looked at the evidence to say, how good is exercise as an intervention for people with depressive symptoms and clinical depression? And the evidence as an approach is that it can significantly and clinically meaningfully improve people's depressive symptoms. And I don't need to talk to anybody in this room working in, in musculoskeletal care about the importance of moving more for musculoskeletal health. But one of the really fair criticisms of exercise as an intervention for depression is that the randomized control trials had previously been relatively small, often less than 100 people in each arm, and less than six months, a short-term follow-up. But a, a really robust randomized control trial was conducted um, in, in Sweden in 2016. And they did a three-armed randomized control trial with over 900 people, 300 plus in each arm. They had usual care, um, CBT delivered via the internet, and then also structured exercise to treat people with depression. And what they found after 12 months, a so long-term follow-up, 300 people plus in the in intervention, is that both exercise and CBT were significantly and clinically better than treatment as usual, but there was no difference between CBT and exercise. And I think we'd all acknowledge just how important and uh, what a central role CBT has in people's management of depression um, but here, this robust randomized control trial is showing that exercise is, uh, uh, you know, just similar effects within this. Most of the evidence to date has looked at exercise that gets your heart up and going, but there's emerging evidence in musculoskeletal care, but also in mental health care, that resistance training, moving your muscles against the load, can also improve your depressive symptoms. And um, some colleagues in Ireland published this paper in JAMA Psychiatry last year to demonstrate that getting people moving their muscles against um, their body weight or other resistance can improve mental health symptoms in people who have depressive symptoms alone or other long-term conditions such as musculoskeletal um, disorders. Um, I probably won't labour this point too much, but now as an actual intervention in, in depression, anxiety or other mental health conditions, um, we're really sort of uh, bulging with, with evidence now that exercise can improve people's physical health but also people's mental health. And really, it's a, it's, a, it's a gap in implementation now. We have the robust evidence, and now we need to move uh, to implementation. So what are the mechanisms about why does physical activity and exercise improve people's mental health? And some of these mechanisms could be related to why it may improve people's physical health, particularly in the context of musculoskeletal care. Um, so this was uh, Aaron Candola, who, who published this paper earlier this year, and said, clearly there are a number of psychosocial mechanisms which contribute to the benefits of physical activity, such as improving self-esteem, a sense of satisfaction, um, sense of social support, often doing it as part of a group. But there are a number of neurobiological factors as well which can contribute and improve 
people's um, mental health as well and also people's physical health. So um, you know, exercise can reduce inflammation, improve connectivity in key parts of the brain and also get volume changes within key areas of the brain which are related to mental health and cognitive health as well, such as the hippocampus. But clearly it's complex and multifactorial as it is in the context of musculoskeletal disorders. Has anybody come across the moving medicine resource? Great. So moving medicine have done a wonderful job of um, introducing physical activity in a robust, evidence-based manner in lots of different individual conditions. And for people with depression, uh, this resource was developed as it was for other conditions as well, where you can have a one-minute conversation, a five-minute conversation, or a more-minute conversation, depending on how much time you have, to stop, ask, and, and, and encourage an individual to be more active. Um, so where are we in mental health services in terms of the evidence base and, and guidelines is um, with uh, many sort of physician colleagues, psychiatrists, psychologists, um, we looked at the totality, the evidence base of exercise as an intervention for lots of mental health conditions and demonstrated that uh, physical activity and, and exercise should be a core part of people's treatment for depression, also people uh, improving people's physical and mental health with schizophrenia, cognitive health, quality of life, and there's some promising evidence for people with bipolar disorder also. Um, just to also mention... Uh, the, our recent Lancet uh, commission where we looked at how do we protect the physical health of people that use mental health care services. Um, this was a huge effort of over 40 authors all over the world, including um, people that uh, are experts by experience, carers, uh, GPs, physicians, global health experts, psychiatrists, um, dieticians, you name it, they're involved. And essentially... Um, it's a 30,000 word document, but if you don't have time to read it, we understand. So here's a good infographic to summarise the key areas. Um, so essentially the key areas which were identified within uh, this area were um, the increased elevated rates of, of, of smoking for people in mental health care services. And while we've had a great reduction in the general population, um, rates have remained relatively high in mental health service users, and this is clearly contributing to the increased um, physical health care burden, but also early deaths we see in mental health care service users. Um, there's also uh, an issue around suboptimal prescribing uh, and monitoring of side effects of psychotropic medication and proactive um, prescribing of physical health care medication for people who use mental health care services, and we have a whole section on that. And there's a real key part around... Um, modifiable lifestyle factors such as looking at people's nutrition, people's sleep, um, people's stress management and people's physical activity. And if you look at all of the different mental health and substance use disorder conditions, you consistently see that these are key risk factors which are um, uh, raised and an opportunity to intervene. But also um, we've got this fragmented uh, mental and physical health care divide across services. So the hospital that I work at, the Maudsley, is, is a perfect example of this. Um, what, we've got a huge road um, going down the middle, and on one side we've got the mental health hospital, and on the other side we've got the physical health care hospital, and we have computer systems that don't talk to each other, and um, we, you know, we don't really cross over the road to each other. It's just a perfect depiction of the, the, the split between physical and mental health care. And clearly, if we're going to tackle this, um, we need to work together, which is why it's such a great opportunity to come and talk about mental health in the context of musculoskeletal disorders, because we're, we're, we're clearly better together to improve people's outcomes. Um, and I think that's really the, the, the key point going forward is, is clearly we all have physical health and we, we all have mental health. And to have better outcomes for our pain or for our mental health, we need to be considered uh, as one and not have this complete separation of, of, of mental health and physical health care going forward. And there's some really nice examples of that having better outcomes. Um, I think I'll just summarise uh, now, hopefully I've been able to illustrate that mental health is, is clearly all of our business 
and I can't honestly think of an area where it should be more of everybody's business than musculoskeletal conditions where primary symptoms are pain, fatigue, difficulty moving. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a cauldron pot of, of, of key risk factors for increased mental health comorbidity. And um, uh, at a population level, being able to hopefully demonstrate that moving more is good for your mental health. I don't need to tell you how good it is for your physical health, but as an intervention, um, it can be very, very useful for people's pain management, musculoskeletal health, and mental health care going forwards. And, and, and a final um, point, um, I think it's really important that we acknowledge the difficulties and the symptoms that co-occur in people with musculoskeletal conditions and mental health comorbidity. Um, if you're in pain or if you're feeling low, it's often difficult to get up out of bed in the morning, go and attend appointment if you're depressed, opening letters, being aware of appointments. And the current system is set up as I understand, to uh, discharge people or if you don't turn up for a couple of appointments. And for any of you who've experienced depression or another mental health condition, you'll know just how difficult it can be to open letters and do the most basic things. So if we're set up to uh, discharge and people after not attending a couple of appointments, I hope we're not um, inadvertently discriminating against people with mental health comorbidity, but also people with musculoskeletal conditions as well. Um, I'll skip over that, but just to uh, also acknowledge a, a huge number of people, far too many people to put on this slide. Um, thank you again for the really kind invitation to come and talk about mental health over the course of this evening. Hopefully I've uh, done it justice to illustrate the importance of, of mental health and the need to work together. Um, and without all of these people and many, many others, if it wasn't for their kind input and 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 support, I'd have probably had a 30 second talk. So I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. We, we don't know that for sure, no. So, uh, particularly in the context of, of mental health, musculoskeletal health, but I think that'd be a really important avenue to explore further. My own anecdotal clinical experience is that the more that you're giving to people of active ingredients, the better outcomes people will have. Thank you. I'd just like to say I agree with every point that you made. Thank you. Thank you. And Laura, do you have a... Thanks. As a, as a former research neuroscientist who now works in MS Health, thank you. That was, that was phenomenal. You've got me on the evidence. The question is, what do we do next? Do we start with Parkrun? Do we start with mental health services and get them to support people with MS Health conditions? Do we start with physiotherapy services and get them to support mental health conditions? What do we ask the next government to do? Well, you're going to get a biased answer because you're asking a physiotherapist who works in mental health care services. <laughs> um, 
So I, 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 think, I think there is, there is, there is real benefit, as we, we heard tonight, about having experts working together. I think, to be fair, you know, physiotherapists, psychologists, and ideally a complement of a full multidisciplinary team to work together, because clearly together we're better going forwards. Um, I think there are some really good wins going forwards in terms of park run and helping people to be more active. Um, particularly adapting for people who may find it difficult to move for a physical or a mental health care issue going forwards. Um, and I should also say that um, we've got the first park run happening in a mental health trust at the Bethlehem, so anybody's welcome to come and join that in Croydon. Um, and we're doing that from a two-pronged uh, approach um, because also there's a lot of stigma around mental health hospitals and coming into institutions. So we're inviting people into our mental health hospital to come and take part in a park run to see that you know it is an OK place and people are people. And also to enable our service users to feel a sense of engagement and also integration with wider society. Um, and we're seeing really great positive benefits in terms of reducing stigma but also getting people moving more um, and it's great to see that integration for people going forwards. So I think uh, going forwards, I think integration of mental health and physical health care services coming together would be would, would best. Um, but there's some great examples of interventions happening, such as Park Run. so much for bringing that in and, uh, and I'm really glad that you did because um, you know the guidelines released in JAMA at the end of last year really emphasised for the people with physical and mental health conditions just getting started and getting up and moving is a really really important start um, and that's my own clinical experience as well I'm working with people who are uh, often confined to a, a ward and can't leave a space as big as this so just encouraging people to make really small changes is really really important start and those those guidelines are, are not meant to be scary targets because as many times in my life i've got nowhere near them um, and from talking to people clinically with mental health and musculoskeletal issues talking about 150 minutes scares people right off immediately and understandably so and it is really important just to start the conversation just doing you know a 30 second bow is a really important start getting off the bus stop earlier on so that's a really important message, so thank you for iterating that. And the issue around um, promoting staff and feeling confidence, that's, that's really, really important as well. And, and in mental health care services, we're often very unconfident in terms of discussing people's physical health, particularly musculoskeletal health and physical activity. So some colleagues in, in, in Sydney have done a, a trial recently where they've targeted mental health care staff around increasing their confidence in physical activity, nutrition, smoking cessation, giving them access to programmes, because if we're more confident as practitioners, then we're much more likely to make recommendations around that going forward as well. And that works in the way that the orthopaedic surgeons are told to stick with their specialty and not comment on things outside their area of expertise, <laughs> which I think has been pivotal in saying we're not to discuss the glaringly obvious problem in the room, which is the anxiety and the depression mm -hmm. that the patients have which I think is a good is a good note to uh, to end on um, in the sense of um, let's all do what we can to make sure that there are fewer missed opportunities to raise that issue of mental health um, in whatever way. Um, it's an issue that uh, ARMA will continue to push on. Um, you've all got the flyers about our webinars. We've got a number of webinars that are about integrating physical and mental health 
in different ways. Um, and we will, as I say, continue to, to push these issues next year. Um, but uh, I'd now invite you, if you would like to continue the discussion downstairs over another glass of whatever you choose, to, to please feel free to do so. And uh, please thank both of our speakers, both Brendan and also Sue. Thank you very much. <laughs>